Well, we spent the last two weeks talking about God's kind of love, 1 Corinthians 13, what it looks like, um, and how we get it, how we can grow in love. by simply reading the word, applying it to our lives, acting on it. Um, it's not enough just to say, well, I love you. No, but you need to act like it too, just like God does. God proved that he loved us, didn't he? He proves it all the time. He's just always there. He's always taking care of stuff for us. That's God's love. Well, today we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 13, the last verse, just for a moment. Let's open our Bibles there. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. It says, but now, well, okay, now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. My translation says, now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, they abide. Faith and hope and love. Those three, what does abide mean? They're going to be there all the time. They're just there. God made it that way. He wants us to have faith. He wants us to have hope. He doesn't want us to live a life without hope. And he teaches us how to love. His love is there for us, and he helps us to learn to love. Those three things will always be there, and they're not abstract concepts. These are very practical things. God wants to help us apply them in our lives. Not just talk about it, but actually be able to live it. In that Godspeed translation, it says, these are the great three. I like that. These are the great three. What are the great three? Faith, hope, love. Why are they great? They, they intertwine. Um, Galatians 5.6 tells us, first of all, that faith works through love. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. So um, if you want to have faith and you want to stand in faith, you need to be walking in love. But then Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith comes from hope. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You have to hope first before you can have faith. Um, you have to know where to focus your faith on. It comes out of hope. Romans 5 verse 5 says, And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hope causes love to come. You have to hope first to, to learn to love. So all these things are working together. You can't just take them apart and say only this. No, it's all faith, hope, love, hope, love, faith, etc., etc. We need all three of them. So we spent two weeks talking about love. But now we're going to look at something that's often overlooked, often downplayed. We spend a lot of focus on faith. We need faith. Faith is very important. But guess what? You need hope first. So today we're just going to spend time looking at hope. First of all, who are you hoping in? Uh, that's a good question. Are you hoping in people? Are you hoping in your family or your friends? Are you hoping in the government? Some people do. You know, when you do these things, the chances of them failing It's always there. Because these are humans, they're human institutions, they're not going to always stand. The only one you can actually place your hope in is our unchanging, faithful God. He doesn't change. Psalm 39, verse 7 tells us that. Psalm 39, 7 says, And now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. What am I waiting for? I need help. I'm going to hope in God, aren't I? It's so important we learn to do this. we got to hope in the right place. Government, people, friends, family, they're not going to be there always. God will. remember years ago when we were still living in Austria, uh, the cost of living was pretty high. And though my husband had a skilled job, skilled, uh, it was a government job. And the government made sure that the government employees were always low, had low pay. Everybody earned more money than government employees, and they knew that. In fact, it was so bad that for the railroad workers, which he was a master railroad builder, they would give him a bag of sugar and some tea bags, and they'd give him some pop in the summer and, and some bars of soap. That's pretty bad. That was written in the law because they underpaid them so bad. Uh, and so that made it kind of hard. 
and funds are really tight and things cost very much. I, I bought one pair of jeans for my first child there and it cost $60, baby jeans. Um, I could not do that for four kids on a regular basis. This was just, yeah, we needed some help from God. And so things were tight. We were trying to make it. And then I turn on the news one night and they're saying, da, 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 a recession is coming. Everybody tighten your belts. Well, look at this family over here. They, they can't even afford to go on two ski vacations this year. They can only go on one. Now that, excuse me. We can't go on one. We can't go on any vacation. We're just trying to feed everybody and put shoes on our feet. Um, Boy, I got so desperate inside. I thought, God, what are we doing here? It's going to be even tighter. It's going to be even worse than it is. And then the Holy Spirit spoke up inside me. That's the voice you want to hear. And he said, now, wait a minute. It's impossible, isn't it? I said, yeah, God, this is impossible. And he said, that's right. That's the time you give it to God. Because you know he's the one that takes care of impossible things. You know, when he said that to me, I suddenly went, oh, I just relax. Well, I knew God took care of the impossible things. How many times had he already done it for me? My God of the impossible. I thought, oh, of course. Of course. We can't cover this debt. We can't take care of ourselves. Obviously, God, this is, it has to be a God thing. Oh, now it's a God thing. That means I take my fingers off, lay it down. God, you see it? You know we can't. Lay it in your hands. Now you are going to take care of us. And then that peace came back. And then hope came back. Hope in God. Why? Because he was the only one that could get us out of that, out of that problem. And in the end, he did. My hope had to be in him. You know, we'd spent a lot of time last year talking about the Ephesians prayers. The one in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. You notice the very first thing that we're told to ask for. In Ephesians 1, verse 18, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. The first thing we need is hope. What kind of hope do we get because God called us? A lot. We have that hope in him. He's there. He's there. And when God's there, he comes with everything he has. All of his being, all of his love, all of his forgiveness, all of his mercy, all of his provision, everything he has comes. The hope of his calling, that needs to be strong inside of us. Just like in that case, when I suddenly realized this is a God thing, oh, okay, God's here. He's going to, do, he's going to deal with this for me. We need to know the hope of our calling. Hope comes before faith. You know, Hebrews 11, 1, we looked at that. But let's read that one more time. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I like Moffat translation says, now faith means we're confident of what we hope for. You're hoping for stuff, but if you have faith, if you really believe in God, then you believe that thing I'm hoping for, God's going to take care of it. But again, how can I have faith unless I have hope first? You've been in a place where it feels like there's no hope left. There's no hope. There's nothing changing. It just, there's no way out of this thing. How are you going to have faith? We got to come back and get our hope from God. How do I get hope when it's missing? I go back to the word. What does God say? Who is he anyways? Can I trust him? Is he faithful? Will he provide for me? Will he forgive me? Will he heal me? Will he take care of me? Yeah, it's all there. Go back to the word and get your hope restored. You know, Proverbs thirteen twelve tells us, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred, um, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. What is deferred? It means uh, you're hoping for something. You ever been there? You're really hoping something happens in your life, and then it just falls through, and you just kind of... Uh, you might have had your hopes up so high. This thing's going to work. I remember years ago, my mother did that. She was not doing well physically anymore. It was coming to her last years. And she got this thing in the mail from the publisher's clearinghouse. They're going to have in a drawing. And, you know, you just buy a little thing and you keep sending this back in. And your name is still in the list. And then she kept, so every time it came in, the more she, little things she bought, the more they sent her letters and said, you're still on the list. Oh, you're on the end list. You're on the short list. You know, and she got her hopes up so high. And she meant, well, she wanted to help everybody. She said, man, I win that thing. I, I'm going to have all this money. I'm going to pay off everybody's debts. 
I'll buy everybody a new car. I'm going to take care of everything we need. We're going to be in good shape. I'm taking care of this family. Her heart was right. But guess what? Her hope was in the wrong place. Because when the time came for the drawing, guess who didn't win? Of course not. And then I saw she was kind of deflated. Well, no wonder. See, you hope. And we can hope. But we need to remember the only one who will not disappoint you is God himself. What do you do? When your hopes get deflated. Psalm 42. We'll look at that. You ever been in a place where you just, your hope is just gone and you get depressed and you feel desperate and you don't really know your way out? David was kind of in that place in Psalm 42. But he knew one thing he needed to do. I might be desperate. I might be depressed, but one thing. So he talked to himself. Some people say, well, don't talk to yourself. That means you're weird. Nuh-uh. If you're smart, you're going to talk to yourself. Why? You need to tell yourself what to do. Your spirit man inside, he needs to tell your mind that's going crazy and your emotions that are out of control. Uh Uh-uh. We're calming down right now. We're looking at God. In Psalm 42, verse 5, he said, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. He just talked to himself and he said, look, David, why are you desperate? Why are you worked up? You put your hope back on God. You start looking at God again and stop looking at the circumstances and stop looking at your feelings and all the things that are not going right. Hope in God. I will again praise him. You know what? When you hope, you start praising again. That's a good sign. You start building yourself up again. Praising God, my hope comes back. For the help of his presence. A footnote of my Bible says, for the saving acts of his presence. What does that mean when God shows up? He's ready to go. When God shows up, he's got everything he has. Oh, you need God to act? Let's get our hope right again. Start looking back at him again. Job went through a hard time. He was one of those kind of people. In Job chapter 13 um, I don't know if you know anything about Job, but uh, he was a righteous man. It looked like he was doing everything right. But one day, one day he lost everything, all of his riches and his children. He had 10 kids. They all died at once. All of his kids, all of his riches. And not only that, he got this horrible sickness that caused him to get blisters all over his body. So he took this broken piece of ceramic and started scraping the blisters off. I mean, how miserable. Everything was gone. He didn't understand. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on here? I mean, I've been in that place before, haven't you? Are you asking, God, what's happening? What's happening? I don't understand this. I don't understand this, God, you know. But so Job 13, verse 15, he made a good choice. He said, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Nevertheless, I will argue my ways before him. We'll leave that one there a minute. Though he slay me, I'll hope in him. Well, God wasn't doing it. He didn't know why this stuff was happening. It turns out, see, Job had been living in fear. And fear is the devil's territory. He was afraid that his kids might sin. And so he'd, as soon as they would get together and eat and, and have a party, he'd go out and make a sacrifice just in case one had sinned. He was so afraid his kids would mess up. And in the end, that fear opened the door to the devil to attack him. You see, some people say, well, God, God put that on him. No, he didn't. He was already, he already had that door open for the devil to attack because of his fear. He just didn't realize it. God said, you know, and the devil went and God said, look, he was bragging on Job. And the devil said, oh, because you protect him. God said, he is in your hand, but you may not kill him. He, He would not allow the devil to destroy him. The devil had the right to attack and he did. But God, in the end, delivered him from that. Job did not last forever. They say it the longest that happened, all happened within the period of a year. At the end of that time, Job was restored. God healed him. He restored his wealth. He got more kids. He said most beautiful women, his daughters were the most beautiful women in that area. Everybody bragged on his girls. He got twice as much as he had before. Why? Because he wouldn't stop holding on to God. He said, though you slay me, I'll trust you. Sometimes I feel like that. I don't understand what's happening. You ever been there? 
don't understand it all. But one thing I know, God's with me. And, of course, God's never the one that attacks you. Who comes to steal and kill and destroy? We know that. That's a devil, isn't it? The one stealing from you, killing stuff in your life and destroying you, it's always the devil. It is never God causing your life to go into misery. He's there to dig you out of it. In Psalm 38, David went through a hard time. He was another one of these guys. Psalms are wonderful because David is just very honest and blunt with his feelings. We're just going to pick out several verses from Psalm 38. Um, he said, verse 3, there's no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There's no health in my bones because of my sin. Verse 5 says, my wounds go foul and fester because of my folly. What is he saying here? He's sick. Pretty sick on top of it. He's got wounds. His bones are a mess. And then back to verse 4. What else was happening? For my iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they weigh too much for me. David was in sin. He was sick, and he was in sin. What else was going on? Verse 12. Those who seek my life lay, lay snares for me. And those who seek to injure me have threatened destruction, and they devise treachery all day long. There are people out to get him. Literally people out to get him, waiting for him to fall, waiting to take him out. I mean, David is in a bad place. He's sick. People were after him, and he knew he'd sinned. What do you do with that? Let's read verse 15. For I hope in thee, O Lord, thou wilt answer, O Lord, my God put his eyes where they belonged. I'm going to hope in God. And what did he do while he was hoping in God? Verse 18. For I confess my iniquity. I'm full of anxiety because of my sin. He did the right thing. I was wrong. How do I get back? How do I get this mess straightened out? First thing I do is I repent. God, I'm sorry. I messed up. Forgive me, please. He knew who could heal him. He knew who could protect him. He knew who was on his side. Remember that time when um, David was doing really well, and then one day he got careless. And he's walking on his balcony and looks over, and there's this beautiful woman taking a bath in her backyard. Her husband was a soldier. He wasn't home. He saw that, and he thought, ooh. And so he committed adultery, already sin. And then when that woman got pregnant, he made it worse. He called her husband to come home. I thought, well, I'll just send him in to her. But he wouldn't go home because he thought, that's disloyal. I can't go. We're in the middle of battle. And so I thought, that's it. So he sent back a message to the captain of the army and said, put him out where the fighting's the worst so that he dies. So the captain of the army did that. That man had to carry that message back himself. Can you imagine his loyalty? I mean, this was a grievous sin. They put him, sure enough, the captain of the army put him in a dangerous place, and they said they pulled back and let him get killed. So now David takes his wife and makes him his wife, and, and it's okay. She's pregnant. She's David's wife now, so everything's good. He thought he covered it up, but he did not cover it up. God watched, saw the whole thing, and he sent a prophet to him to say, you will be judged for this. What did David do? David repented big time. David repented. God told him through that prophet, yeah, this child will not live. That child just carrying me. It's not going to live. And sure enough, a couple of days after that baby was born, that baby died. But David learned something. He learned to get on his face before God. He knew he deserved it. He'd messed up completely, but God was merciful. God showed his mercy to David there because after he repented, he had peace with God again. He and that, his wife Bathsheba were able to have Solomon. Solomon was a sign of God's mercy. It was a sign to David, I've forgiven you, and this one's going to be okay. And we know Solomon became the next king of Israel. The mercy of God to him. But the only way to change that mess he was in was to get on his face before God. Repent. In Psalm 71, it said that it's David talking at the end of his life. And I think it's really interesting because, you know, David went through a lot of stuff. But he also had a good relationship with God from the time he was a young man. Psalm 71, verse 5 says, For you are my hope 
O Lord God, you are my confidence from my youth. Remember David was out with the sheep, writing psalms, playing his harp, taking the sling and killing the bear and the lion. God made him strong. You're my confidence from my youth. David learned to trust God from the time he was a young man. And then when he was anointed king of Israel, the current king, Saul, did not like that, so he tried to kill him. So David was running the whole time. He had to hide in caves. He had to, uh, to save his life. He had to get away. And in the same time, he was sneaking off with some of his men and taking care of the enemies of Israel. He was loyal. But he had to hide from Saul. Can you imagine what that felt like? No one. I'm the next king, and yet I'm sleeping in a cave here. Um, David learned to hold on to God. Verse 14 says, But as for me, I will hope continually, and I will praise thee yet more and more. I will hope continually and praise thee more and more. When we're really hoping in God, then it's easier to praise. God will change his situation. God's going to work this thing out. David refused to touch Saul. He didn't take it in his own hands. He didn't make himself king. He knew that was not the way. If God said he was going to do it, then God's going to do it. And God did. He took care of the matter without David stepping into sin. Here's a verse that's really good in Romans 15, talking about hope. We're almost there. Romans 15, verse 13. Fifteen, thirteen. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The God of hope, he fills you with joy and peace in believing. You know, if you believe in God, joy will come. If you really believe in God, peace will come. Like I said that time, when I was so desperate, when I turned my eyes in the right place, ah, oh, the peace of God came back. Joy and peace is part of hoping in God. That you may abound in hope with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's trying to help you keep your hope up. Don't look at the world around you. The world will always fail. The world will always fail. How many times have we trusted, oh, this thing's going to work out, and somebody made that promise, and somebody, you know, said, I'm going to do this for you, and then guess what they do? They back out. Mm. God never backs out on you. He'll always be the one that's there. One more verse, Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse 13 and 14. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Look at verse 13 again. I would have despaired unless. I would have despaired. You ever been there? I would have despaired unless I had believed. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Hope won't let me despair. Faith won't let me despair. Huh? When you're on the edge of despairing, and say, it's never going to change. It's never going to go right with me. Everything is a mess forever. I say, mm -mm. God didn't say that. God said words of hope to me. A future in a hope, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. I have a, f a future in a hope for you. I have a future in a hope, hope for you. I have that for you. God said that. I'm not going to be desperate. I'm just going to believe God. I see him in the land of the living. A lot of people, some Christians, they say, well, yeah, life is bad today, but in the sweet by and by, everything will be good. In other words, when they get to heaven, when they're, when they're already with Jesus in eternity, then everything's good. Well, that's great. Eternity's going to be nice. Oh, we'll appreciate it. But guess what? Today, in the nasty now and now, God's here. Yeah, sometimes it's pretty nasty, isn't it? What we're living in. But God's still here, and he's got hope for us today. And he's going to show us his goodness right here in this life. We can trust him to do that. Let's pray. So grateful, Father, that you teach us to hope in you. Father, please help us to keep our, our eyes on you, to keep our focus on you no matter what happens around us. No matter who does what or says what or what happens in the world, Lord, we will not be distressed. We will not be in despair because we believe. We'll see your goodness in this land, the land of the living.
Thank you, Father, for taking care of us. Help us to grow in our love, in our faith, and in our hope. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.